Hello and welcome to my channel and welcome to this week's Thursday Thoughts in which I discuss my reading progress and my thoughts and impressions of the books I have been reading this past week. I read the first book of 20 chapters of The Prime Minister by Anthony Trollope and as Steve has already really reviewed them I will leave a link to his video in the show notes below. Instead, I will read two sections which deal with the two main plots. The first one deals with Ferdinand Lopez, who is in love with a Miss Emily Wharton, who, whose father disapproves of Lopez as a possible husband for his daughter because no one knows who he is or what his family was, and he is a Portuguese and therefore not an English gentleman. And Mr Wharton has told Lopez to stay away from his daughter. In chapter 14, A Lover's Perseverance, Ferdinand Lopez is in conversation with a Mrs Roby, who is Emily's aunt, and has been encouraging Lopez to con continue his pursuit of Emily, who incidentally is an heiress to a fortune of £60,000, which would be in excess of £4 million today. Trollope writes, Ferdinand Lopez learned immediately through Mrs Roby that the early departure of Emily and her father for Herefordshire had been fixed. Mr Wharton thinks that by removing Emily from Ferdinand's sphere of influence he can get both of them to change their minds about one another. I should go to him and speak very plainly, said Mrs Roby. He can't b bite you. I'm not in the least afraid of his b biting me. You can talk so well, I should tell him everything, especially about money, which I'm sure is all right. Yes, that, that is all right, said Lopez, smiling. And about your people, which I've no doubt you think is all wrong. I don't know anything ab about it, said Mrs Roby, and I don't much care. He has old world notions. At any rate, you should say something so that he should not be able to complain to her that you'd kept him in the dark. If there's anything to be known, it's much b b better to have it known. But there is nothing to be known. Then tell him nothing, but still tell it to him. After that, you must trust to her. I don't suppose she'd go off with you. No, I'm sure she wouldn't. But she's as obstinate as a mule. She'll get the b b b b better of him if you really mean it. He assured her that he did really mean it and determined that he would take her advice as to seeing, or endeavouring to see, Mr Wharton once again. But before doing so, he thought it to be expedient to put his house into order so that he might be able to make a statement of his affairs if asked to do so. Whether they were flourishing or the reverse, it might be necessary that he should have to speak of them with, at any rate, apparent candour. The second main plot deals with Plantagenet Palliser as Prime Minister and his wife, Glencora, who has extensive plans to entertain, entertain all of London High Society at Gatherham Castle, the Palliser country seat. Glencora is making radical changes to the grounds and is spending large sums of money in renovations, preparations and wholesale changes to the grounds. Plantagenet goes to view what is taking place in his grounds and is perturbed that it will make him look ridiculous. Trollope writes, When he got back to the house, he found his wife alone in the small room in which they intended to dine. After all her labours, she was now reclining for the few minutes of her husband's absence. Sorry, for the few minutes her husband's absence might allow her knowing that after dinner they were a, there were a score of letters for her to write. I don't think, said she, I was ever so tired in my life. But it isn't such a very long journey after all. But it's a very big house, and I've been, I think, into every room since I've been here, and I've moved most of the furniture in the drawing rooms with my own hands, and I've counted the pounds of b butter in and inspected sheets and tablecloths. Was that necessary, Glencora? If I had gone to bed instead, the world, I suppose, would have gone on and Sir Orlando Drought would have still left the House of Commons. But things should be looked after, I suppose. 
there are people to do it. You are like Martha, troubling yourself with many things. I always felt that Martha was very ill-used. If there were no Marthas, there would never be anything fit to eat. But it's odd how sure a wife is to be scolded. If I did nothing at all, that wouldn't please a busy, hard-working man like you. I don't know that I have scolded. Not as yet. Are you going to begin? Not to scold, my dear. Looking back, can you remember that I ever scolded you? I can remember a great many times when you ought. But to tell you the truth, I don't like all that you've done here. I cannot see that it was necessary. People make changes in their gardens without necessity sometimes. But these changes are made because of your guests. Had they been made to gratify your own taste, I would have said nothing. Although even in that case, I think you might have told me what you proposed to do. What, when you are so burdened with work that you do not know how to turn? I'm never so burdened that I cannot turn to you, but as you know, that is not what I complain of. If it were done for yourself, though it were the wildest vagary, I would learn to like it, but it distresses me to think that what might have been good enough for our friends before should be thought to be insufficient because of the office I hold. There is a, I was almost going to say vulgarity about it, which distresses me. Vulgarity? she exclaimed, jumping up from the sofa. Uh, I, I retract the word. I would not for the world say anything that should annoy you, but pray, pray, do not go on with it. Then again, he left her. I read the first three chapters of 70 pages of The Glorious Cause by Robert Middlecoff. The following subjective comments should be taken in the context of David Murphy's objective analysis of this work. He is erudite, knowledgeable and thorough. So be sure to check out David's channel for his take on this work. There is a link to his discussion of the first 10 chapters of The Glorious Cause in the show notes below. The Glorious Cause is not a popular history meant for the general reader, but an academic study of the American Revolution. The author, Robert Middlecoff, does not appear to be promoting any original ideas of his own. Instead, he has gleaned ideas from a score of other works and has created a patchwork of thoughts loosely strung together in each chapter. He moves from one source, then to another. Almost every paragraph has a quoted source note. The book strikes me as a useful reference work for academic study, the sort of text recommended as required reading to students taking a college class on the American Revolution. But as a book for the general reader, it falls short of narrative appeal, in spite of what the publishers claim for it. They say this is outstanding narrative history in the grand style, an eloquent and dramatic account of vital events and vibrant figures which will unquestionably become the basic opus on the Revolutionary War. That may well be. But I found the writing to be disjointed and lacking in narrative flow. The focus on politics and political theory rather than on people and events in the three chapters I read makes it hard going in places. If you want political discourse on the American Revolution, then this is undoubtedly the go-to book. If you want basically information and detailed facts about the American Revolution, Middlecoff supplies these abundantly. But if you're looking for an absorbing and thrilling narrative that will sweep you up into the dramatic events and fascinating people involved in them, then you'll probably need to look elsewhere. This is a textbook for serious students and not a book to be read for pleasure. So that's all folks, but I'll be back soon with another booktube video.